Welcome to Season 3 of the Climate Conscious Podcast. I'm your host, Deval Bazi, bringing awareness to climate change and sustainable development from a Caribbean perspective. Connecting you to sustainability solutions as we move from awareness to action. Today's special guest is an engineer, social entrepreneur, and creative. Born in Canaan, Tobago, her passion for the environment has allowed her to conduct environmental research during university and start a full-time career in sustainability at Campbell Soup Company. She is the co-founder of Carney Cycle, through which she has been able to transform her hobby of upcycling and creating jewelry into an integral part of its business structure. She believes that the shift towards being environmentally aware should be a fun and self-reflective journey and wants to do her best to help others realize that on their journey. I am delighted to welcome to the Climate Conscious Podcast, Ms. Dani McClatchy. Hi, Dani. Hi. So happy Plastic Free July. Thank you. This is actually the first time I'm actively doing a full month of Plastic Free Julying. <laughs> oh, really? Since I found it. Mm-hmm. I was actually introduced to the movement last year. And that really pushed me. It amped up my single-use plastic elimination drive. Yeah. I don't know if it's, did it start last year? Because I found out about it last year as well. But, like, I was not in it 100% like I am this year. Yeah, I'm not sure if it started last year. I think it, it existed prior to that. But, you know, in the environmental world, we have so many different things that we celebrate. We have... Earth Day, World Environment Day, World Oceans Day, Soil Day. Um, <laughs> there's even a Global Recycling Day. But I was mm-hmm. really happy to, to discover that we have the entire month of July to celebrate going plastic free. Mm-hmm. But for any of our listeners that are not familiar, can you share with us what Plastic Free July is all about? Yeah. So discovered it again last year and Plastic Free July is a global movement founded in Australia, I believe. Um, And at its core, it's just a movement that encourages people to uh, start their plastic-free journey or improve their plastic-free journey through learning about different types of plastics and its harm to the environment. But most of all, learn like how we can do our part to stop like the harms of plastic um, to our body and to our environment. Yeah, so I just did a quick Google search and I realized that Plastic Free July was started way back in 2011. Wow. Yeah, I did not know that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, better late than never. I'm, I'm glad that we're, you know, more people are catching on to this. Some people might might wonder, you know, what what's the big deal about plastic? You know, why is plastic a problem? What would you say to that? Through my journey of discovering to, to answering that question, uh, I guess the biggest problem of plastic is that we're using a finite resource um, to create plastic, and we're disposing of it at a non-finite rate, like every single day, like tons of like millions of plastic and it just doesn't disappear. So we're using a resource that's very limited and um, we're not using it wisely, you know, or correctly. And because it doesn't, doesn't disappear, it's like coming back to affect not only us, but like our future generations in a very negative way. You know, we're using finite resources and generating infinite waste mm-hmm. uh, because plastic is not biodegradable and it accumulates in our ecosystems. So, for example, my mom purchased um, some disposable containers 
and I've been trying to encourage her to do do the transition. So instead of buying um, the traditional styrofoam, when I was with her, we bought the compostable, those compostable containers. But unsupervised, she picked up um, a package of styrofoam containers. But there's a label saying biodegradable. And I'm like, how? How is this? How is styrofoam biodegradable? That's funny. Like, a lot of companies, companies do greenwash these days and I guess for our audience who don't know greenwash is marketing something as green natural eco-friendly um when it's not really or you know they may get away because maybe there's like one percent of it that may qualify as green but styrofoam is like the plastic that is completely (laughs) unrecyclable so um you know, technically, it, it, they're correct because every single thing biodegrades after like a million years. Yeah, but at what rate, right? <laughs> at what rate? Like, pe- companies should be banned if um, things don't biodegrade in a certain rate, I think, because it's misleading a lot of people. Yes, it is. And you, and you think that, okay, I'm doing something good for the environment, but it seems like we need the plastic police, right? <laughs> Nobody likes the plastic police, but we need the plastic police. <laughs> <laughs> We're talking about Plastic Free July, and to some it may sound overwhelming or it may sound impractical, but I, I like to think of it in terms of becoming plastic positive. What I mean by that is if we become, if we as consumers, and also producers, if we become more mindful of our choices and the end result, the outcome of the choices that we make, and we become a bit more conscious as this podcast tries to encourage, you know, we can reduce our impact when we make better choices. We may not be able to go plastic-free 100% because we have to accept that plastics are a feature of modern-day life, and they do provide they do add value to our lives especially now when we're in a pandemic and you know everything is so scary crazy (laughs) but there are there are ways there are areas where we can definitely minimize the amount of plastic waste that we generate i 100 percent agree i think i don't i don't know what to call what we're in right now but I don't know if it's a conscious wave or an environmental awareness wave or whatever period we're in where, you know, people are raising their voices and people are actually kind of opening their ears to actually be receptive because, you know, people have been advocating for this for quite a long time. But um, I think with social media and everything, uh, people are finally understanding how much of a problem uh, we've or environmental crisis we are in right now and um plastic being one of the main contributors to that it can be very overwhelming but um I think my taking the time to learn that first of all that I don't think plastic was ever the enemy um it was like it's being demonized but it has so much applications to healthcare like you're saying like my glasses frames are plastic and all of those things so it has been very helpful to us um but it's I think the disposable plastic is where we went wrong (laughs) um mixed in with a splash of capitalism so like they didn't really care what happened or you know they actually like told people like it was okay to dispose at at a rate and um us kind of just reeling back in that. And so now we know that it's not okay. So now we need to find ways in our lives uh, where we can reduce our plastic consumption um, so that, you know, other people have a chance to live in the future. Um, and it's it's both something that us as consumers should be doing as well as companies should be doing. I think we both have parts to play in fighting this plastic crisis. Absolutely. So, Danny, switching gears a bit, if we look at Trinidad and Tobago's carnival, which has evolved from its origins as 
the enslaved Africans recreation of the French plantation owner's pre-lantern masquerade, also known as Camboli, to an annual celebration of their emancipation, then to Pretty Mass and, and as we know it, Bikini and Beads and the Parade of the Bands. But in November 2018, Canny Cycle was born with a mission to bridge the gap between our carnival culture and sustainability. And I think this is an important aspect of the evolution of the sacred and emblematic part of our culture. And there's a saying that goes, you know, it only takes a spark. So what was the spark that got Canon Cycle going? <laughs> well, it was a mixture of two things. One, I've always just loved carnival. <laughs> grew up going back and forth in Tobago but my spark for carnival stemmed from my mom because um she goes to carnival every single year (laughs) and plays faithfully and so um yeah that was one spark and I love carnival because of its vibrancy positivity I love soca music um and just being out there jumping up and down and he is just so great the other spark on the environmental side, my co-founder and I um, went to Bishops in Tobago and we both um, found that we both had a spark or um, just a love or passion for the environment. Um, on his end, he liked nature. On my end, I didn't really like overconsumption. So I felt bad like using endless plastic bottles and I would just reuse my water bottles all the time. Um, and We decided basically four years later after college to start a business um, in the green sector because Tobago, unlike Trinidad, didn't have much going on in the green space. And so we decided to have um, found a business. But one of our criteria was that the message behind the business was to kind of encourage people to, you know, do what we're asking in a positive way. So using positive psychology, positive messaging behind it, Um, because we've done a lot of research and because we were in the space ourselves, we realized that a lot of the awareness campaigns out there, um, while important, they were pushing like, you know, the oils on the bird um as well as mm -hmm, just doom and gloom and so that's so important because the shock value really makes you think like what what the heck (laughs) um this is what's actually happening but for a lot of people they get shocked then they don't really do anything you know what I mean (laughs) yeah there's like a thin line that the shock value can push you over to not even caring anymore because it's like what can I do (laughs) Yeah, and then, you know, that's coupled with, like, seeing shock throughout everyday life. You know, you kind of get desensitized to that thing to the point where, okay, you know what I mean? (laughs) There's no difference from, like, watching the news or anything like that. Yeah. But a lot of psychology studies show is that when people can relate to something or, you know, they enjoy doing something or they feel good about doing something, they're most likely to like keep the habit of it. You know what I mean? Um, So that's why we decided to go that route. And we really, it's just one day randomly, we went through so many different business plans and like our heads just landed on carnival, <laughs> to be honest. It was like, God spoke to us and was just like, here. <laughs> so, you know, when we thought about carnival, it was just like, okay, um, carnival. And then we, we thought about primarily the costume. So we thought about what happens to the costumes every year. Right. Um, and this was also a time when I was planning to go to planning to go to China carnival with my friends, but that never happened. But <laughs> yeah, we were trying to figure out what happened to the costumes every year. So we did research and then we realized that like every single year there are new themes for the bands and like carnival the way it's become like super business oriented um like you have to to be to participate in carnival you have to pay for a ticket which is the costume plus like the experience and if you want to participate next year and the year after you got to do the same thing <laughs> and so 
I looked at my experience with my mom and like I remember that like the first three years she may have come home with her costume put it up on the wall but never ever after again and then I remember specifically one year (laughs) that um she was leaving and I was just like we're you're not bringing home your costume and she's just like now I'm just gonna leave it in the hotel they throw it away from me so like then I thought I was talking to Luke I was just like I wonder how many other people have this experience so we did a mini survey and we found out that around you know 38 percent of people throw away at least one part of their costume and so that was just for people in our immediate circle that study had like 150 responses and um we realized that well trinidad carnival isn't just the only carnival going on there's uh, over 150 carnivals in the world so this is happening over and over again and the material used in these costumes are mostly plastic materials. The rhinestones, even the fabric are polyester, which is basically plastic. Um, they're using animal feathers and they're just importing and using these materials just for one time use for the most part. And it was crazy. Then we got into other parts of the carnival. Um, the textile waste in Juve, people, you know, wearing band t-shirts and throwing that away. A lot of foreigners do that. I know a lot of locals keep it. Like, I keep my shirts, but a lot of foreigners throw away shirts and shoes. Um, Then on the road, there's not enough trash cans, so you see a lot of plastic bottles and beer cans that are not getting recycled. So we realized that you know, in the first three months of research, like, carnival is actually unsustainable. <laughs> wow. And, mm-hmm. and then we realized nobody was doing anything about it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you definitely identified a problem that most people did not know existed. You know, the average masquerader, as your study showed, they would just dump their costume. Or, you know, some may keep it for sentimental reasons, but if like your mom and you play every year, that sentimental value is lost. So no one is thinking about the environmental impact and there's no demand for (laughs) biodegradable or compostable costumes, right? And even beyond the parade of the bands, if you think about the fets and all the other events, Juve, as you mentioned, there's a lot of waste being generated and in particular, a lot of single-use plastic. So we can see how Carnival can have a major environmental footprint. And you mentioned the capitalist aspect of it. And it seems like capitalism is at odds with sustainability. But is there space for a circular Carnival? Definitely. I think um, there's definitely space for a circular Carnival where the materials we use for one Carnival um, can be used to the end of its life cycle so it could be at the end of your carnival or if we open up branches to use your costume multiple times a year at the end of the year and then once that's finished the costume is broken down um and then the materials are sanitized clean and then used to create a new costume i think there's definitely room for that because of the amount of people who play costume i mean carnival So the amount of materials that can, you know, flow around a couple more times than at least once, you know what I mean? And we've seen some of that. So we were founded in November 2018. And in April 2019, we had our first costume recycling (laughs) initiative in Jamaica. And um, we only did that because between (laughs) November to like February or March, Trinidad and Tobago Carnival seemed too scary. (laughs) to tackle when we didn't even know what we were doing (laughs) so um yeah Luke was going to university in Jamaica at the time so we had that connection there and um yeah between April 2019 and then February 2020 which was our last carnival before pandemic took over the rest of the year we um recycled over 200 costumes And um, we were able to break down the costumes, like I was saying, and clean them. And we had an upcoming band um, purchase some things for prototyping costume for Miami Carnival now. We had 
because that's, you know, happening. We have um, designers purchasing feathers and gems to prototype costumes. And then we've also had locals who are interested in arts and crafts um, because rhinestones and feathers, because they're everything is imported, they're just, they're actually extremely expensive. So we're giving people um, who don't have a chance to purchase these things often or at all, like a chance to buy them at even below wholesale price, just, you know, um, so they, they could choose a more sustainable option. So it's, it's definitely possible. <laughs> well, I'm so happy to hear that. So I know you, you started in April 2019, and you, I'm sure you would have been building momentum, and then the pandemic hit. So how has your operation been affected, and how did you pivot? Yeah, pandemic definitely forced everybody in the world to slow down, and we were not um, excluded from that. <laughs> Um, the first couple months were a little tough because uh, we were realizing, like, okay, yeah, well, there's no carnivals. And, you know, at the beginning, yeah, we had a lockdown, but we were able to do a couple events, like have markets every every month to collect costumes still. So we were still collecting costumes and we could still, you know, sell some of the, the items to people who wanted them. But we basically just pivoted to um, working on our business model more and making connections and increasing our environmental awareness part of the mission because that is a very extremely important part of this whole initiative. You can't really change what you don't understand. (laughs) So we've been focused on having webinars throughout the pandemic, um, increasing our networking locally um, through the Caribbean region, even like internationally. And we've been doing some fun things. We've been showing people different ways how to upcycle their costume right at home since we couldn't, you know, go anywhere. And um, we've been planning for the future. (laughs) <laughs> basically for when we were able to go back into the carnival world and we didn't want to quite go back to carnival this year in Miami carnival um we made a kind of firm decision to just um go to the carnival next year because of the whole variants and things like that we just thought it was the safer decision but We've also competed in the Planting Seeds competition. Um, We've completed in the Green Innovation Challenge. And we got shortlisted to the top 15 out of over 100 applicants. And we did like a week-long kind of program and pitch. Uh, We didn't get top three, but, you know, we've done a couple of competitions throughout the pandemic as well. And we're always getting so close. So I think we're, you know, the next couple we're gonna keep trying and we should strike goals soon (laughs) but yeah we've been we've been busy it's just not with carnivals (laughs) well congrats on being shortlisted and definitely keep at it because i think this is such a brilliant initiative well one good thing about the pandemic is that it has forced us all to converge in the online space And there has been such beautiful exchange of ideas and interaction and community building, especially in the environmental space, which I think has been edging away at the lack of awareness. I think, um, you know, we've both studied environmental and, and had a natural inclination to care about the environment, but not everyone is so inclined. The level of awareness definitely is growing. The level of interest that persons of different age groups are showing. And I see that in terms of, as one example, some of the feedback that I get from listeners to the podcast. And when I bring on guests like yourself to share the things that they're doing, people are amazed and they, they're genuinely interested. And I think that stimulates them to consider their individual impact as well as our collective impact as a, as a community. Yeah, super great. You hit it like right on the nail. Like the community building that happened over COVID was like incredible. Like 
the support, um, you know, we've given each other, like I've received and like given out to different people. Um, I think it really went a long way for us to make it through because to be honest, it was kind of like at one point I almost didn't think like we could recover from this. And um, I I got a spark of hope from someone <laughs> who's very passionate about encouraging me to work on a project related to Carn Cycle. And, um, you know, that was kind of all it took for me to get out of my slump, you know? So I think a lot of people maybe ran into some of those moments during the pandemic. So I'm very grateful for that online community that was built. Yeah. Definitely. I mean, the, the pandemic has been rough on all of us, you know, in different ways. But the online space has really provided, has really been a source of support and encouragement. And even entertainment, you know, just to relieve some of that, that sh- built up stress. <laughs> that is true. Like, I was so, I was sad about slowing down. But, you know, thinking back at the rate we were going, um, and I still have my full-time job and Luke still has his full-time job. It was literally like no sleep. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think another, um, if we're looking for the silver lining in this very negative event, um, I think the pandemic also created space for sustainability to, come to the forefront or become part of the mainstream Um, Mm -hmm. because we we saw the impact I think both in our personal lives and also in the environment when things slowed down and I think it allowed us to recognize how unsustainable our ways of living are you know how unsustainable the systems that we are in how unsustainable they are and it gave us the opportunity to think of another another way of doing things. Think of alternatives. Many persons do not want to return to the pre-pandemic normal in, in its entirety. So I think it gave us the opportunity to really redesign our lives, either personally or as a collective, and really attempt to do this thing called life <laughs> on planet it in a more sustainable manner and the service that you are providing in terms of allowing masqueraders allowing fetters to enjoy carnival which we hope would re- return to trinidad and tobago soon hopefully 2022 fingers crossed but to do it in a sustainable manner that is is more in harmony which to me is the basis or the core of sustainability more in harmony with the natural environment. Yeah. Um, right now, we're trying to um, explore kind of the further end, how costumes from the start can be made with the intention of being reused, or at least some parts of the costume, maybe like the backpack, shoulder pads, or something, just some parts of the costume. Um, doesn't have to be everything from the jump, but we're having discussions with like designers behind the scenes and um, we've talked to like swim call and some of these other uh, companies. And right now it's a little too early to make decisions on what's going to happen, but we really want to see when carnival 2022 come back, like more receptacles on the street they hire a company to clean up so that our streets are spotless after carnival, but all the plastic and bottles that fall on the floor because there's not enough trash bins, um, those aren't recycled or separated. They all go to the dump. So in addition to putting more trash cans that are easily accessible to everyone on the road, um, having separate people to pick up recyclables and separate people to pick up trash afterwards so that we can take it to the recycling center is from call. You know, changes like that, I think, are just a start to having a more sustainable carnival. And then soon we could be like London's carnival, where um, about two, three years ago, 
um, they started taking their recycling waste and like making energy out of it. Um, we don't have that infrastructure in place right now, but you know, they're doing it and they started their carnival way after us, you know? <laughs> so we should definitely be pioneering some of these things as the greatest show on the earth. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I mean, we like to, to think of ourselves as the Mecca of carnival. So definitely we should be innovating new ways of doing carnival. Mm-hmm. Um, I would like to also see like, um, uh, this is also something that's being worked on European carnivals, but like, like our music trucks being run on like biodiesel um, instead of diesel. Um, Cause you know, they burn a lot <laughs> throughout the day. There are just a lot of different things from even like the FET standpoint, we've been talking to different promoters. Um, some have been open to trying to do like consulting to ensure that before they start their carnival or when they start their party planning, um, what are the ways they can make changes um, so that their bets are more sustainable? Um, so discussions are being had, but I think everyone's just waiting. Um, everyone just wants to be kind of certain whether we're having carnival or not. But I have hope and I'm very optimistic that, you know, once we get that green light, we can start making some changes with everyone's help. <laughs> And it's interesting that earlier you mentioned, like when you all were just getting started up, that Tobago was kind of lagging behind in terms of sustainability and going green. And now we see where Tobago is actually leading Trinidad by having the TRRI initiative where you have a recycling and recovery facility that's being run in partnership with the THA. And I featured the managing director of that facility on episode 18. And I was so impressed by the the grand ambitions that Tobago has to transition to zero waste to landfill. So I think as a country, there's a lot for us to do, but I'm always happy to see that we're making progress in, in different areas. And waste is definitely a big problem, plastic waste in particular. And I guess we need to tackle it from all sides. And County Cycle is definitely providing a a much needed solution that has so much potential to revolutionize our carnival culture to become one that is sustainable. Oh, thanks. That's so sweet. (laughs) Um, Yeah, we still have the same fire and energy um, of when we started. And yeah, we're so happy to see um not only just the re- the recovery facility that's in works and um the collection containers that have been put out put out on the island but um they're also leading the green hotels initiative so sustainable tourism is just um the biggest part of Tobago and which it should be because unlike Trinidad and Tobago I mean Trinidad uh, we don't have that large manufacturing, you know what I mean? So I, I like to say that, you know, it's like the three Ps, the triple Ps or whatever, people, profit, planet. And so they, they're all connected. So to sustain Tobago, you need to do it environmentally friendly, but also economically and, you know, socially. Sustainable tourism is on the rise. So, you know, by them implementing those things and they rely on tourism they can help drive more tourism to the island which can increase the economy there and yeah like when we started this they didn't have any of that (laughs) we were sending we were sending our plastic to trinidad off and on sometimes but not all the time so we would have beach cleanups and collect all this plastic and put them in a a certain part of our landfill. And, you know, sometimes it will make its way into turn out over the boat. Sometimes it'll just end up back in the big pile of waste. (laughs) So, um, yeah, Tobago had a lot of work to be done. (laughs) Go Tobago. (laughs) And hopefully Trinidad. Trinidad will be catching up soon. Yeah. 
I'm talking like we're two separate places, but we're only one country. So like as a country, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it, it's hard. Like, um, yeah, sometimes I have to catch myself. That's so off topic, but it's easy to when you're just living on one island um, to just say that over and over again. But um, I think that that whole segregation of the islands has contributed to some of our problems, like not being on the same page. So yeah, yeah, Trinbago is going in the right direction, and I'm very happy. Yes, I totally agree. So, Danny, what advice would you give to an aspiring social entrepreneur? Let's see, what advice would I give? So. If you're a social entrepreneur, well, no, if you're a person aspiring to be a social entrepreneur, um, my advice would be to find something that you love to do and find a way to integrate sustainability into it. Um, an example I mean by that is, let's just say I had a friend who she's doing an event planning service. So she loves to plan events. That's her thing. She loves to make things beautiful and give people wonderful experiences. And then she was looking at this bra recycling webinar that we had and said, I want to do something like that, that, you know, makes an impact on people. Well, I told her, you're already doing that, but just find a way to make it more sustainable whether it's the products that you use during your event planning services or the products that you reuse from event to event, or whether you create a model where like you plan an event for free or at a reduced price for maybe like a woman's shelter or like for an environmental business that doesn't have as much money. And so you're contributing back in a way that you already know how to do so. So um, that my advice would be to find something that you love to do and then integrate sustainability into it. Great advice. There's a space for sustainability in everything that we do. So you don't have to be a sustainability expert to make a contribution. You just have to have the desire and the will and the interest to explore and consider alternatives that can improve the impact of whatever it is you're doing. Yeah. Right now, it's like sustainability is a niche when it should really just be integrated in like our life. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Yeah. So I totally agree. So what's next for Connie Cycle? That's next for Connie Cycle. So we're having a bunch of webinars coming up soon. So I implore everyone to stay tuned to our social media, um, our Instagram and Facebook page at carnicycle.com. Um, we also are finishing off the rest of Plastic Free July. Um, and we have weekly talks on Fridays called Eco Chats, where you can um, stay updated about like you know what's going on in the environmental community a lot of our topics relate to carnival itself and sustainability and some are just like new environmental finds like recycled braiding hair <laughs> which i thought is really cool and if you play carnival and you get your hair done you can definitely go and get you some <laughs> so um, we're keeping up our awareness campaign and we're waiting for this lockdown to lighten up a little bit so we can start collecting costumes again. Yeah, stay tuned for our webinars coming up and our talks and the rest of Plastic Week July. Awesome. So as we wrap up today's episode, can you leave us with a few tips for having a better Plastic Free July? Yes. Okay. So um, the first thing would be don't be overwhelmed. <laughs> Just take things at your own pace. There's no wrong way of doing Plastic Free July, even if you mess up. Secondly, make sure to do your audits, right? So what gets measured gets changed. So every week you should be at least looking back at your consumption if you're not doing that like throughout the week and 
taking notes of what plastic you use most because then that's the top area you can change. And then the last thing would be cliche, but I mean, just have fun with it. It's supposed to be fun or else like you won't do it (laughs) ever. Like you won't do it past this month if it's not fun. So find fun ways of doing it, whether it's like encouraging your friends to do it um, or just learning more about it so that you can, can connect with it more, but just have fun. Yeah. Again, there's just no wrong way of doing plastic free July. Thank you so much, Danny, for joining me on the Climate Conscious Podcast and for sharing insights on Carney Cycle and Plastic Free July. Thank you so much, Cheval. Um, It was great talking to you. And I mean, your podcast is awesome. <laughs> Thank so, you. So um, definitely have shared it to other people and we'll um, share this episode as well. And I'm just honored to be a guest on this podcast <laughs> thank you and guys be sure to go follow Kani cycle on all major social media platforms and share your plastic free july activities with us tag at Kani cycle and at the climate conscious mm-hmm.